You're listening to AM Now, an Accounting Matters podcast. I'm Adam Olson. And I'm Matt Fisser. Summer may be cooling off, but the FASB is keeping it hot with the release of their proposed ASU. It addresses two topics, the first of which is to refine the scope of derivative accounting as the board receives stakeholder feedback that many different types of contracts were evaluated and potentially accounted for as a derivative, but measuring these contracts at fair value did not provide useful information for decision making. The proposed ASU excludes from derivative accounting certain contracts with underlyings based on the operations or activities of one of the parties to the contract. Examples of these underlyings include financial statement metrics, achieving a product development milestone, and achieving an ESG target. If the contract has multiple underlyings, in order to determine whether the entire contract falls within the scope of derivative accounting, an entity should assess which underlying is expected to have the largest expected effect on changes in the fair value of the contract, otherwise known as the predominant characteristics assessment. The proposed ASU on this topic is expected to one, reduce the cost and complexity of evaluating whether these contracts are derivatives, two, better portray the economics of those contracts in the financial statements, and three, reduce diversity in practice resulting from changing interpretations of the existing guidance. And the second topic in the proposed ASU clarifies which guidance and entities should apply to recognize share-based payments received from a customer in a revenue contract as consideration for the transfer of goods or services. The FASB addressed this matter as there was growing concerns over diversity in practice. And the short answer here is ASC 606 applies. The share-based payment would be recognized as an asset measured at the estimated fair value at contract inception under 606 when the entity has a right to receive or retain the share-based payment and it's not contingent on the satisfaction of a performance obligation. Here, the proposed ASU is looking to provide investors with more comparable information and reduce accounting complexity and related reporting costs for preparers and auditors. Interested parties have until October 21st to provide public comment on this proposed ASU. Yeah, and moving on to the IASB, they've been busy themselves working through their slew of standard setting projects. Up first, the IASB recently completed their second comprehensive review of the IFRS for SMEs accounting standard. And if you're not familiar with it, the IFRS for SMEs accounting standards presents a simplification from the full IFRS accounting standards to make it more applicable for small and medium sized entities. The newest edition will be effective for annual reporting periods beginning on or after January 1st of 2027 and will be issued sometime in the first half of next year. The current edition, in case you're curious, can be still found on the IFRS's website. Next, the IASB made some final decisions on their rate regulated activities project, which aims to provide a model on how to account for rate regulated activities. Ultimately, the goal of this model is to help investors understand fluctuations in a company's revenue and expenses and positions on the balance sheet caused by differences in timing of rate regulation. The IASB will now work on drafting a new accounting standard with a goal to issue in the second half of next year. The new accounting standard will have an effective date of January 1st, 2029, and early adoption will be permitted. And finally, the IASB has also concluded its post-implementation review of IFRS 15, its standard on revenue from contracts with customers. Their verdict here, IFRS 15 is a success and working as intended, and they opted against including certain explanatory paragraphs in the standard itself. A project summary and feedback statement of the review will be released in the coming months. Some may say IFRS 15 has got the gold already. Mm -hmm. Sticking with the IFRS, they recently released an exposure draft proposing amendments to IFRS 19, Subsidiaries Without Public Accountability Disclosures, which was introduced in May 2024. As you may recall from earlier episodes, IFRS 19 permits eligible subsidiaries to provide reduced disclosures when applying IFRS in their separate financial statements. Subsidiaries are eligible to apply IFRS 19 if they do not have public accountability and if their parent company applies IFRS in the consolidated financial statements. A subsidiary does not have public accountability if it does not have equities or debt listed on a stock exchange and does not hold assets in a fiduciary capacity or broad group of outsiders. Yeah, these proposed amendments aim to reduce disclosure requirements for new IFRS standards and amendments issued between February of 2021 and May of 2024. Initially, full disclosure requirements from new standards issued after February of 2021 were included in IFRS 19, but the IASB is now seeking feedback on reducing these requirements. 
The proposed changes focus on simplifying disclosures related to lack of exchangeability, international tax reform, supplier finance arrangements, primary financial statements, and non-current liabilities with covenants. The draft also includes indicative disclosures for the upcoming accounting standard on regulatory assets and liabilities and seeks feedback on their practicality for eligible subsidiaries. These amendments are designed to streamline the disclosure requirements for such subsidiaries, making it easier for them to prepare financial statements while still providing useful information to users. The proposed changes aim to reduce the burden on these entities by allowing them to apply reduced disclosure requirements aligning with the needs of users who do not require the full range of disclosures mandated for publicly accountable entities. And as new standards are adopted, IFRS 19 will continue to be amended to provide alternatives for eligible companies. Feedback is accepted until November 27th. Yeah, and the last IFRS update we have for you is their proposed inclusion of illustrative examples in the IFRS standards to enhance the reporting of climate-related and other uncertainties in the financial statements. This initiative is part of a broader effort to improve transparency and ensure that companies adequately address and disclose the impacts of climate-related risks and other uncertainties on their financial performance, and was prompted by concerns that financial statement disclosures did not align with information provided elsewhere. These illustrative examples would clarify rather than amend the current standards and are intended to provide clearer guidance on how to reflect climate-related risks and uncertainties in financial statements. This includes how these factors might impact areas such as asset valuation, impairment, and provisions. Feedback may be given until November 28, 2024. And finally this week, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol has released a set of frequently asked questions to help companies in applying their standards. The FAQs include 19 questions covering a broad range of topics related to its corporate standard. They include questions and detailed responses to things like, how do I calculate scope to emissions when activity data is not available? How do I choose an appropriate emission factor? How do I deal with complex company structures and shared ownership? And hey, I'm unsure how to account for an acquisition or divestiture. The facts are meant to be helpful, but are not the authoritative source of information. Those looking to apply the greenhouse gas protocol standards to comply with regulatory sustainability reporting requirements for the first time may want to familiarize themselves with this latest resource. And that rounds us out for this week. For a deeper dive into what's trending in accounting, finance, and sustainability reporting, check out our other podcast on the Accounting Matters feed on your preferred listening platform. Again, I'm Adam Olson. And I'm Matt Fisser. From your friends at Embark, thanks for listening to AM Now.